and personally approve the hiring of nearly every new employee. Both Bryn and Paige come from brainy families. Larry's dad is a computer science professor. Sergey's dad, a math professor. They even look a little bit alike, but in their personalities, they're opposite. Paige is shy, almost introverted. Bryn, more outgoing, something of a showman. Is it true that you're a gymnast? I've done various acrobatic things over time. I, uh, that I took some gymnastics classes at Stanford, and I've taken some circus classes since then. At, uh, Yes, I did flying trapeze and trampoline and things. Really? Really? Yeah, just from, but I'm not very good. What he is good at, and Paige as well, is writing computer code. They met as PhD students at Stanford, where both were trying to figure out how to make information easier to find on the Internet. They realized that a lot of search engines of the time, the Dark Ages, 1998, inundated you with a bewildering, disorganized list of every website that contained the words you were searching for. And we said, well, no, we should, it's actually our job to produce the best possible results. So your breakthrough was saying, here's the most important and the second most important and so forth. That's correct. Brynn and Page's breakthrough was a series of algorithms, software code, that created a ranking system by relevance for the Internet. They install their software on Stanford's computers. So how did you get from Stanford and the sort of theoretical project you were doing for your PhD into a business? Well, we had created a test search engine. Which they named Google, a play on the word Google, a math term meaning one followed by a hundred zeros. We just let a few of our friends know about it, so they would go uh, to that website or the test search engine, try it out. And People started to use it more and more, and word spread. It, you know, it really started to grow, and eventually we ran out of computers. They started building their own computers and moved into their world headquarters, that garage. We were very conservative. Uh, we didn't hire very many people. We never ran Super Bowl ads like many other dot-coms. Remember, this was at the height of the dot-com boom. When that boom went bust in late 2000, says Silicon Valley author John Battelle, Google was one of the few survivors. Google was this, this odd company that it seemed like the internet bus never happened. The lava lamps were going, they had a chef, they had parties, everyone was happy, everyone seemed to be enjoying their work. Now most of the Silicon Valley, the opposite was true. It was a smoldering wreckage. <laughs> and, and so they, they hired some of the smartest, best engineers they could find during a time when they were so thankful to have a job. There was something else different about Google, the company motto, do no evil. Where did that come from and what does it really mean? We tried to boil it down at some point to a code uh, of conduct, so to speak, for Google. Well, how do we make all our decisions? Uh, for example, uh, we don't uh, mix our ads with our search results. We always label the advertising clearly down the side of the page. And that, that comes under do no evil. That's right. There's no business relationship or anything that controls the search results. To this day, Google has never run a TV commercial. Their popularity has spread literally around the world by word of mouth, as people everywhere search for everything under the sun. So let's do a search for 60 Minutes. And these are web pages that contain the term 60 Minutes. 19 million web pages found by Google's computers in a fifth of a second. But it seems to me that all the the ones that are listed here in a fast glancing down are all controversial. They're okay. all pieces that ran on 60 Minutes that have created some kind of controversy. And that's a big problem with Google. Its ranking system tends to put negative events or statements at the top of the list. If you Google a person, mm -hmm. for instance, mm -hmm. what kind of a picture of that person can you really get? Uh, an entirely skewed one, um, in my opinion. When anybody puts in a name, and, and that person has had a, a, a terrible event. That will become her life. That will life. become who she is in the world. Google CEO Eric Schmidt. As hard as we try, we have not yet understood how to make value and moral judgments about information. And we can't distinguish between hugely popular, accurate information and hugely popular, dated information. Skewed. Or skewed. Yeah. Uh, we try our best, but it's imperfect. We're working on better ways of understanding. That's not their only challenge. 
The main thing now is managing the company's explosive success. They're expanding so quickly that they might just blow up, that the wheels might just come off, that it's very difficult to manage a company that's growing as quickly as Google. Are people inside saying, oh my God, it could get out of control? We worry about it every day. We put a set of systems in place to try to address it. Um, our internal enemy is growing and, and losing control of that growth. A good example, Google is hiring about 25 new people every week, and it receives more than a thousand resumes a day. But they are determined to stick to their rigorous screening process. The most important thing that I do is to try to hire the best people, and we do it with a huge team here. Alan Eustace is the engineer who's in charge of luring computer geeks to Google. What is this? The GLAD is the Google Labs <laughs> aptitude test. It's, it's kind of a fun challenge. It's not a fun challenge. It's the most intimidating thing I've ever seen in my life. Google recently placed these tests in technical magazines, hoping some really big brains would tackle the really hard problems. How many different ways can you color an ICO Sahedron with one of three colors on each face? Well, you one, don't even understand that question. No, I do. It's a 20-side <laughs> polyhedron. <laughs> but it's an interesting problem. There's a certain class of people in the world that thinks those problems are fun. Here's one. What number comes next in this sequence? 10, 9, 60, 90, 70, 66. If you can answer that, you might get a job interview and then another and another. One recent hire had 14 interviews before they got the job, and that was in the PR department. It's not necessarily an easy process to get the best people, the most motivated people, people that are on a mission. Once they do get them, Google does everything possible to keep them happy. One day we're sitting in, this, in my staff meeting, and Larry said, we're not having enough parties. And I said to the, the two of them, we have more parties than any other company I've ever seen. <laughs> and they said, we have to have another party. It looks like every day's a party. Good stuff today, guys. They have a fantastic cafeteria where the food is all free, and you can get Chinese, Mexican, sure. deli food, kosher food, any kind of food, yep. all free. All free. In fact, the company makes money by having that free lunch because people stay on campus, they don't go out, they don't waste time. So often they get the food and go back to their desk. This is crucial. As well-fed and casual as they may look, these folks are intense, burn-the-midnight, fluorescent workaholics, all trying to come up with Google's next big thing. One of the ideas that we're working on is machine translation, and we strongly believe that there's enough data on the web and in the world right now to allow us to automatically translate from one language to the other. Are you saying that if I search for something and there's an article in Russian, that I'll one day be able to sort of press a button and it'll automatically come out in English? That's exactly what I'm saying. Now that can't happen right away, but that's certainly the goal. That's just one goal. Another is to make TV shows and video clips searchable online. Google has teams working on all sorts of change the world ideas. What do you think is next? What do you yeah. think their next big breakthrough is likely to be? I, I think it could be summed up in Search will no longer live only on your PC. Google is already moving that way. It's testing a new product that allows people to send short text messages from their cell phones and get an immediate reply. You could do a search for, say, Pizza New York and see all the pizza places. Mm -hmm. You could go in New York and... But right on my phone, while well, well, I'm on the street and hungry. Exactly. This isn't just an idea. An early version is already out. Anyone with a text messaging cell phone can play with it for free. So we decided to try it out. I'm standing on West 69th Street in New York City, and I have a headache. And I want to know where the nearest pharmacy is. So I have my phone. I'm going to punch in 46645, which are the numbers that correspond to G-O-O-G-L. The text message I sent was pharmacy 10023. That's all. 10023 is the zip code here. Google's computer sent an immediate reply. And the message says, Joseph's Pharmacy at 216 West 72nd Street, which is just three blocks up here, with a phone number. That took less than 10 seconds. And if that's not science fiction enough, on the not-so-distant horizon, 
the ability, for example, to have a device which is in your pocket, which looks like a phone, um, and you go to a supermarket and you see, oh, a potentially, you know, overpriced box of pasta, and you take that device and you wand it over the product code, and you see comparison prices from Google of three other stores that are within a mile. Okay, that's power. Now that's search, but no one has quite figured out that that's also the future. Sergey Brin won't say if that's Google's future, but there is one ambition he admits to. You, you never got your PhD. You dropped out. We're to technically do this. on leave of absence right now. Will you ever go back and get it? Um, you know, my mom asks me every week, so she still wants you to have oh, your yes, PhD. She definitely wants Something me to, to fall back my PhD. on. So I, I actually do keep meaning to finish it, and I haven't found quite the slot of time.